because we were, we were considering this uh, slide that's up here, and the main focus of yesterday's lecture was looking at investing money and seeing how that goes over time. So if we're looking at uh, this dramatically, just one thing I would, I'd like you to consider if we're going through the next two classes is yesterday's class we were looking at if I take a certain amount of money now in the present time, if I take my present dollars, what is that going to be in the future? Okay, so we're investing a certain amount of money and taking it to the future, seeing how that money is going to grow. Today's class, we're going to spin that around. We're going to go from the future and come back into the present. Okay, but, so let's just recap here what we did yesterday. We said that if we place a certain amount of dollars in our bank account and invest it, we get a certain interest rate. The interest rate is the amount, uh, some percentage that the bank is giving us because we're essentially loaning the money to them. Okay? For most of your life, you'll be doing the opposite. You'll be lending money from the bank. But for the occasions when your bank balance is positive and you're earning interest on that money, you're in fact lending your money to the bank. And they go ahead and, and use that in different ways. So the payment the bank makes to you, for you being generous to lend your money to them, is giving you some fraction of interest rate high. And you take that I and you will get a future balance. You invest that money, you reinvest it, and they'll pay you interest again the second time around and the third time around. We're going to do an exercise today where you simulate a bank account and you can see how money changes over time. And we did this example uh, yesterday where we said that if you invested $1,000, so a one small investment of $1,000 growing at 10%, and then you reinvest your interest. So the first year I get $100 of interest, so now my balance is $1,100. I keep that $1,100 there. Reinvest it, I earn interest the second time around. It, I, get uh, I get $110 in addition. So now my balance is $1,210. And I keep reinvesting and it will grow over time in that manner. So it's a single investment right at the front. You don't make any more payments into your bank account after that point. And then it will grow up to $2,600 odd dollars after 10 years. But this example that I had here yesterday is slightly different. This one says invest $10,000 every year. So put in $10,000 into your account this year, interest at 5%. After the first year, you put in another $10,000. In addition to the 5% interest that you've earned, your balance is now in the order of $21,000 on it. You invest that now at 5%. You put in another $10,000 the third year, and you can go. After 35 years, that amount will grow to just shy of a million dollars. And um, we showed then various case studies on that. Make sure you can duplicate these values. This is absolutely crucial that you can, that you can understand what's going on. That we'll be doing similar exercises in the next assignment. Uh, I know if, uh, at least one or two of you in the class have done this and were emailing me because you weren't able to reproduce those values. So make sure that you can reproduce those numbers. So as I mentioned there, what we've done here is we're putting money in the present and we're predicting the value of it in the future. Now let's consider the opposite. And we can consider it conceptually as following. If I take consider $1,000 today, it's not worth $1,000 a year from now. So let's just make that statement here, and then we're going to actually work with that number going on. So $1,000 in the future is worth less in today's terms. Okay. So, for example, what can we buy with a thousand dollars next year? if inflation is 
one way you can consider that is as follows. $1,000 would be divided by 1.1. In other words, 1 plus that 10% factor. That gets me 909 dollars. Or in terms of our formulas that we're going to start to use today, that same formula we considered yesterday, we say $1,000 in the future, uh, related at 10% interest, is going to be my present value. Taking $1,000 one year from now, and I'm bringing it into the present terms, considering 10% inflation. So that $909, the way we can interpret that is as follows. It's always good to be able to interpret it in, in some easy to use language, rather than this formal language of present value, future value. An easy way to, to read that is an item that you buy for $909 now thousand dollars a year from now. So that's simply a statement of what inflation effect is on spend. And this same equation we used yesterday to predict growth of money over time, if we use it in the opposite way, in other words, if I take future values and I bring them to present terms, so I'm using the equation in the opposite manner, I'm essentially measuring the effect of inflation. So diagrammatically, what I'm doing is I'm taking future values over there and just bringing them over to present day terms. So this example then you can, uh, you can see here uh, where this is going. If one year from now, two, three, and so on years from now, you find a thousand dollars under your mattress, so we're talking actual cash. That thousand dollars has been staying there in actual cash, and you can go buy goods with those dollars. How much would those same goods have cost in today's dollars? So think five years, ten years from now, you find this thousand dollars. So ten years into the future, you go buy a certain amount of goods with those dollars. What we're asking is essentially how much would those same set of goods have cost in today's terms in an environment where there's a certain percentage inflation, say 10%. So those same goods in the future are cost ten uh, cost a thousand dollars in today's terms, those same goods will cost less money. Through that formula over there, we can then look at different periods of time and see, for example, Something, uh, let's say, in 10 years, 10 years' time, if I find that $1,000, I go buy certain goods. If I had to buy those goods in today's terms, they would cost me only $386. So it's a lot cheaper to buy it today than, than buying it 10 years from now in actual dollar figures. Another way you can consider this, if the time value of money, so let's introduce this new term here, inflation in other words, if time value of money is 10%, something that's worth $424 now, you'd have to pay $1,000 in nine years from now. So we're, we're basically taking the concept from yesterday and looking at, at it in the opposite way. Okay. Questions on this, any concerns? Same formula, but just used in a different way. We're replacing interest that we used yesterday with the inflation term, but it's uh, the same, the same principle. Okay, so let's just uh, let's put that aside for now. Let that sink in a bit. We're going to come back to this concept in a minute. What I'd like you uh, to do next is we'll work on this exercise, but I just I forgot about this uh, slide. I just wanted to. Uh, to recap this from yesterday, people were asked, someone in the class had asked yesterday about interest rates in different countries. So here's the Economist's uh, 
If you go look it up, you can get it. This is 7th of September, so earlier this in the week. You can go see the interest rate in Canada right now. A good surrogate for the interest rate is the 10-year bond from the government. That's at 2.7%. So that's typical interest rates at the moment. Um, if you were living in Greece, that would be 10% government bonds. Pakistan and Turkey are, are all above the double, in the double digits. Um, and there's a few other countries further down the risk as well. So low interest rates that we experience here in North America are, are fairly unusual. Most of the world is in the order of 5%. And so this is good to know for many of you that will be working in foreign countries in your career. If you work for some of the big multinationals, when you consider in time value of money, the value of 3 5% uh, may be too low. You need to use higher values depending on, the, on your uh, geographical area that you're working in. Okay. So this sort of data is easily obtained um, and is updated weekly. Is that the question? Yeah. What about the education in each country? So when you have 10%, maybe you would have a like higher level. Right. So that's a good question. So again, this is interest rates from the government bonds. Okay, so inflation rates tend to track inflation, uh, track interest rates. So interest and inflation track each other on the long term. So if interest goes up, inflation will also go up on the longer term. Now, let's be clear, it's longer term. For those of you that are taking business and management courses, you know the correlation is inverse in the short term. So government policy on the short term is to counteract inflation, they raise interest. Okay, so there's a negative correlation on the short term, but on the long term, um, and that's what we're dealing with in this course is years. Um, those two track each other fairly well. So it's a good, it's a good, sorry, good thing. So you see a long term is like 10 years like? Uh, 10, five, 5 years even in, sh in shorter term time frames, yeah. Okay, there is a differential though between interest rates and inflation rates. I'll talk about that near, near the end of the class. Okay, so let's uh, take a look at this example. I'd like you to um, consider this case. Now, obviously the solution is on the next slide, which you will have in front of you. So that might seem fairly pointless to you. So ignore that solution right now. If you look at it, that's fine, but you're not helping yourself. Essentially, what I want you to do is think of your bank account. There's money flowing in, and there's money flowing out, and there's interest being paid on the balance in that bank account. The purpose of me going through this exercise is to show you how I'd like you to present these solutions in exams and tests and even just for yourself when you work them out. The solution that's here on the next slide is the final result in the spreadsheet form after modifying it. But the process of getting to this is, is there's a, a few more steps in between, right? So that's, this is the final endpoint, and this is not what you present in a midterm or in a final exam because there's all the calculations on this. Yeah. So what I want you to do is, is do some of the calculations. We'll do them for, for month 0, 1, and 2, and then, then they become uh, straightforward and repetitive after that. So consider the following. You've got $4,000 in your bank account at the beginning of month 0. You've got no expenses. The bank pays you interest of 5% on that money. That balance then gets carried forward to the next month. And then you've got some additional money coming in. You've also got expenses. Notice our convention that expenses with a negative sign. And then interest gets paid again, and you repeat, repeat, repeat. So do the calculation for the first month, uh, first two months, for month zero and month one, uh, on your own for a few minutes, and then I'll show you how I'd like you to do it. So, uh, so go ahead and, and, give, and work with your neighbor on that. Discuss different ways of simulating this process.
Okay, so let's take a look at, at how to set up this example. I just want you to give it a try yourself. Uh, what you'll find is that usually when you do these examples, the first two, three times you do them, you make a few false starts, you scratch it out and you start all over again because you realize you may not have thought about it quite correctly. And that's normal and that's, that's, that's desirable. So let's take a look at uh, one way to, to solve this. We're really looking for the monthly balance. Okay. This example, we're using months. For most examples that you'll be dealing with in this course, we're going to be looking at years. So at the end of the first month, the balance in the bank account, anyone? 4,200? No, it's 4,000. Anyone want to argue the other way? 4,000, 4,200? We have the term of 5%. 5% interest per month. Interest at the end of the month, you're getting the month. Okay, so banks will generally pay you interest in the next cycle. So you hold your money for $4,000 for the 30 odd days, and then they'll pay you interest the next month for those 30 days prior. Okay, so, so that's, again, there's, you could argue it either way, right? But I'm going to show you the approach where I argue that the interest paid gets paid on the first day of the next month. Okay? But you could quite validly justify that the interest gets paid on the last day of the month. But by and large, banks don't do that. They'll, you hold it for your 30 days and they'll pay you interest in the next month. Okay? 
higher. So let's go with that assumption. So my revenue coming in the first month is $4,000. My expenses are zero. My balance at the end of the month is $4,000. The next month, I get interest on that $4,000 at 5%, that's $200. Now what I'd like you to do is, when you answer these, don't do your calculations in the table. So this gets really hard to grade, and, and you run out of space because your booklet size in, in the midterm and the final exam is, is, doesn't have infinite width, right? So, $200 over here, then make a note there and tell me how you calculated it. So 200 is equal to 0.05 times 4,000. That's sufficient for us to understand what's going on. It's the interest rate, the fact that you've labeled it as interest and that you've used the correct value of 0.05 multiplied by the balance of 4,000. It's good enough to for us to figure it out. What really helps us though is if you start to label these rows as A, B, um, let me just keep consistency of the next slide, I call my balance E and my interest paid, I call C. Okay, so if you write that, you can also then put your C is equal to 0 0.05 times A plus B. Okay. That will, that will, emphasize even further why, uh, why that is. And then you can also write here that E is equal to A plus B. It's not quite right yet. So I'm going to clear up the formula in a minute. So the balance there so far in the first cycle is 4,000 is the sum of the revenue plus the expenses. And the reason why it's plus is because we're using this notation that expenses have or this convention, I should say, that expenses have a negative sign. So A plus B then is my total of or my net, and then my, I earn interest on that at 5%. Now the next month around, I have income or revenue of $530. I have an outgoing expense of $200, so minus $200. I also earn this $200 of interest, so my balance at the end of the first month then is something different. Well, my balance there is the $4,000 I had before from the prior month plus the new revenue of $530 minus the $200 at expense plus the interest earned of $200. So my new balance then, at the end of the first month, is five, uh, four, five, three, zero. So now let's revise the formula there for row E for the balance. E is equal to A plus B plus the interest earned C plus E from the prior cycle. So your balance going forward is the previous month's balance plus the new revenues, expenses, plus B, and interest rates. So using that convention then, calculate for me the entries in the table for month number two, or the third month. I'm labeled two. What should these numbers be? And also particularly one of these calculated values in these cells. Write out the calculated numbers for them. So we've got 530 coming in, that one's easy. Problem. 570 flowing out. But then what are these two values over here? So work on that for a, for a quick minute. So Take no time now.
Okay, interest earned in the second month, or month, uh, the third month, I should say, but month two, N2. 226 something. So uh, we'll always, uh, so here's another thing that we do in this course always is we ignore cents. It's just working dollars. So 0 0.05 times 45 <coughs> and just write that as 227. Also notice I tend not to use dollar symbols in the table. Every every number in there is a dollar, so that just uh, save yourself a little bit of repetition. Fourth uh, entry over here for the balance going forward. Four seven one seven. So that uh, balance is the prior month's balance four five three zero plus the revenue flowing in, plus minus 570, plus the interest earned of 227. It's 4717. So in uh, written midterms and exams, we tend not to go beyond two or three iterations of these, it's, there's no point. Um, for assignments and tutorials, you obviously will be doing this in a spreadsheet in your group on someone's laptop, and so then you will go out for the full length of time. So here's the spreadsheet for it. Um, I, used, I just added an extra row to calculate cash flow. And so I had a row D here in the, in the spreadsheet to calculate the money flowing in, the revenue, plus the expenses, plus the interest earned. Okay, so that's uh, cash flow is shown in blue, and then my account balance is shown with the red parts and taken over the full range. Okay, we're going to use this, this feature over and over in the course for the next three, four weeks. So this is something you must be comfortable with, is simulating uh, bank accounts, or simulating a company's total account balance. Any questions on that? There were a few confused faces in between. I hope that most of you have got uh, sorted out. Yeah. So for the interest for a future, you want, does it matter if you want it in the like, month of or the month after? Right. So it's, over a long period, it, it, it kind of averages out and doesn't make too much of a difference. Obviously, for calculation purposes, you want to stick with one convention. And it's the general convention is that interest earned is for the prior period. So you can stick to that. It's not incorrect, though, to state my convention is interest earned is for the balance at the, within, within the period. But remember that, um, again, it, it really just comes down to how you account for it. A month basis is actually too long to say that. Most banks pay you interest on your daily balance. Okay, so then they don't really lose up. But if the bank was to pay you interest on your monthly balance, there's nothing stopping you from flowing money in and out. And then just on the last day of the month, you put in a balance, okay, and then they they didn't, actually didn't have that money during the month, right? You could you could gain the system that way, but um, so credit cards and interest earned on, on most bank accounts are on a daily basis. Uh, so again, it really just comes down to convention. I would still argue though that you it's it's a better convention to pay for the prior month gets paid in the, in the next month. So if we're going to go ahead with interest, just make sure we stay our convention. So. Set your convention and work with this. Any other questions, concerns on those calculations? This is a very simple example, um, but it's got all the features that we're going to see for the next few weeks. Great. Okay, so let's come back to time value of money now and look at it from both the effect of interest earned as well as inflation. Okay, so remember we had said here, um, coming back to this example of this guy sitting on his chair on the beach, he's raked in all this money, worked really hard at putting $10,000 aside every year, invested it, grown it at 5%, and then you get 
by one million six hundred seventy-seven dollars after forty-five years. What's the problem with that? Will he be? What is that money worth forty-five years from now? Is it worth one point six million? To account for inflation. Okay, so here we've only used interest at five percent. So his interest earned at five percent will get you one point six million. But forty-five years from now, what you can buy with that one point six million isn't what you can buy with that one point six million right now. Okay. So there's an additional wrinkle in everyone's retirement plan right there. It's not just as simple as saving ten thousand dollars every year and hoping for 5% interest and having the money, that amount of money. 45 years from now, that money can probably buy you not, not a whole lot. Okay? So we have to take inflation into account. One way you can immediately understand this is, let's say inflation was also 5%. Okay? Then it's negated the effect of the interest earned. So let's take a look at, at how, that, how that happens. So if you go back on a few slides to where we were, if you do this exercise where you deposit 5,000 into the bank account, you earn interest rate at, at a rate I star, the time value of money or inflation is defined by a rate I dash. Let's take a look at how those two uh, work against each other. So we've looked at this formula, the prior plots. We said I can show my compound interest so that's why we've got that exponent then, because we're compounding over and over at a certain rate I star. I'm investing an amount, a cash flow amount, C0. So we'll, we'll sometimes use this notation as well. I take an amount of cash, C0, put it in, invest it for N periods, it compounds, and I'll get a future amount of F subscript N. But let's take time value of money into account now on that Fn number. If I take that FN number in the future and I bring it back to present day terms using inflation rate I dash or time value of money rate I dash, I can then write that second formula down. Now let's substitute the first FN into the second, into the numerator there, and we get that relationship shown in the third line. Where that cash flow that I've deposited and then escalated into future dollars, and our discount back into current day dollars in the denominator. So the numerator grows my money, the denominator shrinks it back again for me, because both those i's are greater than zero. So both these i's are positive numbers. So my numerator here is a positive, my denominator is a positive. And in, the, in this situation where i star equals i dash, that obviously cancels out, and you've really made no money. So C0 equals P. You've not lost your money either. Okay? So your interest has really just simply cancelled out inflation. So ideally what you'd like though is that your interest earned I star exceeds this discounting rate I dash. You want this numerator to be greater than the denominator so that your money grows in terms of actual value to you. So discount uh, making your money grow in the numerator, discounting your amount of money in the denominator. You need to be comfortable with these two concepts. It's the same formula but just interpreted from different aspects. So maybe uh, one way to help, um, help illustrate that is just to emphasize what we've covered over the past day and a bit, is let's just make note of it this way. When we're looking at equivalence of money, <coughs> our key formula that we use is F, the future value is the present value, plus some interest rate or inflation rate I. We've looked at it in two ways. We've looked at converting present dollars to future dollars. And that process is called investing. So when we're doing that, if I'm taking my money today and I'm <coughs> converting it in, into what I expect in the future, that's an investment. 
suggested to me. And the rate that we use for that, let's just call it I, I subscript I and D. Now when we convert future value into present day, one, one way you can interpret that and is this borrowing. When you borrow money from the bank, you're taking future money that into, and bringing it into present day terms, and that's interest rate is I subscript loan. So that's the rate at which you loan money. And unfortunately, we always have, the banks are in the business of making money, not losing it, so that I loan exceeds investment. So the rate at which you lend money, oh, sorry, the rate at which you borrow money from the bank is uh, always going to be greater than the rate of investment. So if it could, if, if within the same bank, because the same bank is going to always make sure that the for loans exceeds their rate of payment out to investment. So that's just one way to see what we're doing here. We were comfortable yesterday going from present day investment, dollar value P, and seeing what that grows to in the future. But we also have to be considerate of the devaluing of our money, where future dollars are worth less in present day terms. One way to see that, the way we will tend to view that process of future dollars and bring them to present day terms is through this concept of inflation. We're essentially accounting for inflation and bringing future money into present day terms. Okay, so that's a, those are the two, two ways of using that formula. Let's now emphasize that a little bit with this example. This should help, help us understand what this process is doing. So this one's easy to understand. Most of us are very comfortable with investments and then growing on a compound basis. But this might be the first time that you've actually considered inflation in any numerical way. So let's take a look at this simple example. If someone, let's say your parents or a family member, is giving you $1,000 at the start of the year for each of the four years of your undergraduate degree. So every September they give you $1,000. So my period that I'm considering is from September to August. September to August, September to August, for four consecutive years. I'm, that family member writes you a check for $1,000. Next year, another $1,000, another $1,000, another $1,000. Draw a cash flow diagram. Very straightforward. So here's the, here's the solution to that. You just get this check of $1,000, September, 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 September that money comes in. But now let's take a look at the time value of money on $1,000. Determine the, the value for this money, for this income, at the beginning of the first of your first year. Okay, so back in your first year of university, when you first got that $1,000, what is this total value of the $4,000 that you've received? over a thousand dollars every year. What is that worth if you take inflation into account? Okay, so those four checks of a thousand dollars each are not worth four thousand dollars total. If we deflate the value of those into present day terms, that money is actually worth a whole lot less to us. Okay, so let's consider on a timeline what's happening over here. Here we are in 2013 and you've received your final check of $1,000. Then in 2012, and then in 2011. What we're essentially asking is standing over here, if you were back in your first year, Those, what is that value of the $4,000 that you're going to receive over the next four years? What is that value 
at this particular point in time, at the year 2010. And the way we can look at that is recognize that that $1,000 we received in 2010 is worth $1,000. So this $1,000 right now in 2010 is exactly worth $1,000. There's no deflation of that money. But that $1,000 that I received in 2011, even though I received numerically a $1,000 check, back in 2010, it wasn't worth $1,000. Back in 2010, that $1,000 check was only worth, in the time value of money perspective, it's worth $909. Okay. So another way to see that is if that family member had given you $909 back in 2010, you could have invested it at 10% and grown it to be $1,000 come the, come the start of 2011. Okay, so I could have grown that $9,090 to $10,000 by that time. But that $1,000 that I received in 2011, back in 2010, wasn't worth $1,000. It was only worth $909. The 2012 money that you received was worth um, $826. So again, if I had invested it for two years at 10% interest compounded, I could have taken $826, invested it for one year, got 10% interest, invested for another year, and got another 10% interest. By the end of that two-year period, that $826 would have grown to $1,000. So from 2010's perspective, that $1,000 that my family was going to give me two years from now is only worth $826 in 2010. So we're, what we're doing here is exchanging money from one point in time to the equivalent value in another point in time. So I'm taking future money, that future $1,000 I'm going to get, and saying what is that true value for me back two years prior. Okay, so we're going to always come to a baseline, this very first period of time. So this is going to be a common theme over the next few weeks, is pick a baseline. In this case, my baseline is 2010. It happens to be my first year of university. And I'm going to take all future revenues, and later on, we're going to take all future costs. Right now, we're only considering money flowing in. So this money of $1,000, and I'm going to deflate it back to a single reference point and it just happens to be at the start of some nominal point in time, in this case, 2010. So then the final value there was $751 uh, that I received. In my fourth year, I received $1,000, but in actual terms, that $1,000 that I received in fourth year, back in first year, would have only been worth, or is the equivalent value of $751. Another way you can state that is investing at $751 for the next uh, three years would have grown it to $1,000. So we can total those numbers up. 1,000 plus 909 plus 826 plus 751. Total those up and I'm going to get a value of 3487. Yeah, we're at 3.6 something. There's like change and then it rounds up to 87. Yeah. So it's not a so three four eight seven dollars you could have taken that. Your family member, instead of giving you a thousand dollars every year, could have just given you a single check in 2010 for three four eight seven. You could have then taken a thousand dollars off that and then gone and reinvested the balance at ten percent. Wait a year, take another thousand out, re keep reinvesting the balance, take it out, and then on your final year you withdraw out the last thousand dollars and it would be depleted to zero. Okay. So another way to see this is deflation is the opposite of interest. So it's, it's, we could have deposited 3487 at a 10% interest rate and it could have grown. Or I can simply just take it as cash flows and discount each cash flow one at a time and sum them up 
<coughs> into present day terms. Okay, still see a few confused faces here in the class. It's not, not everyone's quite convinced of this process. So, any questions? Any doubts? Yeah. Would it be better if, if we get those four thousand dollars out of front in the first year and then invest it? Like they take one thousand out and then invest the the three thousand in the first year, take another uh, out and then keep investing that instead of getting a thousand every year. Oh yeah, if, if your family member gave you four thousand dollars right in the first year, you're better off, of course. Okay. But not not the person giving the money. So we're, asked, we're what we're trying to do here is understand equivalence. The fact that I'm giving, or your family member gives you a thousand dollars now, and then waits a year gives you another thousand, waits a year gives you another thousand, waits a year gives you another thousand. Because of the declining value of money, that thousand dollars that you get in subsequent years isn't worth a thousand dollars back here at time zero. Okay. What they, what essentially what we're saying is that that family member could have given you three, four, eight, seven dollars right back at time zero. You invested it and spent a thousand every year. By your final year, you'd have zero dollars left. But you would have been able to withdraw a thousand dollars every single year. So what you're saying is that 4,807 total, accounting for time value of money, is equivalent to $1,000 times four deposits over the three, over the, over the three years. Okay, so those two are equivalent. 3487 at time zero is equivalent to $1,000 payments four times over the next three years in terms of monetary equivalence. Okay, so time value of money, an important concept. It's not something that jumps out and is immediately obvious to everyone. Interest earned is easy to understand, but the reverse of that inflation really is no different. It's more just getting, wrapping your head around to the fact that future value, future money is worth less in today's terms. And by how much less is, uh, is calculated through this interest rate. Okay. So we're going to see some more examples. 